If you took all of the data that businesses and consumer generated last year, it comes up to 1.2-ish zettabytes. There's megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes, and zettabytes. Each one of those is a power of uh, three powers of 10 in a quantity. So can't get our heads around a number like 1.2 times 10 to the 21st bytes of data. If you took all of that data and put it on 64 gigabit iPads, 64 gigabyte iPads, it would cover the surface of Wembley Stadium's playing field to a height of 4,000 miles. <laughs> so keep generating because you're kind of going to need a place to put it, and, uh, and I've got a, a great place for you to do that. So this uh, is a history of innovation. I'm now going to read to you, starting on the left-hand column, all of NetApp's innovations. <laughs> um, just at a glance, $5.1 billion in revenue. Uh, last full fiscal year, we're about to report much higher earnings than that. We've had 20% uh, year-on-year growth for nine consecutive quarters. Uh, we're now at over 13,000 employees, 1,400 here in the triangle, 50% of whom weren't there three years ago. What could possibly go wrong? What are some companies that were, like two years ago, at the absolute top of their game? Research in motion. Nokia, Motorola, how long does it take for something to go wrong? Even when everything seems really, really rosy, um, things, things could, could happen. So part of the professor in me is to take uh, best practices, best thinking, theories and, that explain this type of behavior. I'm going to start with a book that comes out of Accenture called Jumping the S-Curve. The uh, subtitle is How to Beat the Growth Cycles, Get on Top and Stay There. Pretty uh, admirable objectives, right? Here's what they define as high performers. You've seen the S-curve, right? Everybody familiar with the concept of an S-curve? Things start slow, grow quick, and tail off. Well, their definition of high performers is those that jump from one S-curve to the next S-curve to the next S-curve. If, if we could figure out a way to formulaically do that, I think that we'd all be happy, right? There's a lot of challenges involved with it, however. The first part of it starts with having what they call a Big enough market insight. Does anybody recognize the product on the screen? It's Porsche Cayenne. It's an SUV made by Porsche. Who in the world do you think was asking for a, a SUV that went zero to 60 in four and a half seconds? Not many people. I, I actually was following one to, to, to the conference this morning, and I noticed, you know, there's no trailer hitch on that car. who needs to get to the game really, really fast. Uh, the interesting thing is that in a market that seemed to be saturated, Porsche had a big enough market insight that there was people who would pay for a performance SUV. They wanted either the appearance or the size or the, the, the stance on the road or something, and they were willing to pay for it from Porsche. It's now the number one selling model from Porsche. It comprises 30% of their sales and a lot of their profit. That's a big enough market insight. Often counterintuitive, but that's, that's, that's an example of it. So NetApp's original big enough market insight was with all this data being storage, you could actually attach specialized data storage appliances to a network. As opposed to having a hard drive directly attached to your PC, we took the storage away and plugged it into the network. Very, very cleverly, like, like engineers are always really uh, hot on marketing, we called it network attached storage. And we have an internal operating system that we call data on tap and it's optimized for those storage requirements. Now, data on tap is kind of interesting. And one of the things that NetApp is the best place to work is every Friday afternoon at 3.30, we have a beer bash. Seven local beers, almost always local, um, although PBR got in there recently. Uh, a couple of non-alcoholic beverages. Everybody from all 1,400 employees are invited to come down and socialize. Uh, all of our releases are named after beers. Rolling Rock, <laughs> Full Steam, Sierra Nevada. They're all on tap. <laughs> so today, we're on on tap version 8. It reminds me of a certain product out of, Mike, of uh, Redmond, Washington. Uh, we've continually improved it enhancement. Uh, we've got some excellent technology. We just released something called cluster mode that allows you to manage your data across a cluster of, of, uh, of, of storage nodes. But got some problems, some dark clouds on the horizon. 
technology continues to evolve, product life cycles accelerate. Now, in other words, we need to invest more, because we're just riding this horse. I'm pulling back the curtain a little bit on, on the internal operations. Um, we need to invest more in new breakthrough innovations. As Jeffrey described what my job is looking out three to five years. My title is senior product manager. I've got a really cool job because I'm a product manager for products that don't exist yet. So I'm looking out to the future and figuring out how to commercialize technologies and introduce it. So here's that S-curve broken down a different way. We've all heard of the technology adoption cycle, right? There's the visionaries, the early adopters, the uh, early majority, late, and the, the wonderfully named laggards. Well, if you look at that little curve at the bottom and superimpose the S-curve on top of it, what you'll notice is that it's just as you're hitting your peak financial performance, you're moving into the late majority. The people who are buying your product now aren't buying it because it's cool technology. They're buying it because it's proven and safe. But what are you going to measure? What did RIM measure? What did Nokia measure? The financial S-curve. They're looking at that model and saying, what could possibly go wrong? The authors at Accenture broke this down into three, thing, three different things. They said there's actually three hidden S-curves that are at work. The first one is that the market relevance ebbs as the basis of competition slips away. In other words, what you used to have that was special isn't so much anymore. The second is the distinctiveness of your capabilities. What makes you special has been copied. Therefore, there are other people who have a very similar product to, to your offering. And the last is your talent development slows. People are starting to leave your company because they're not, you're not focusing on the breakthrough innovations. You're doing more of the same, another flavor of vanilla. So those are the three hidden S-curves that are behind the, the, the ultimate flattening of this S-curve. So the lesson is your financial success is a trailing indicator of your innovation success, often by two or three years. Another principle to introduce, something called value migration. A book by uh, Adrian Slywatsky, Harvard Business School, um, How to Think Several Moves Ahead of Your Competition. The basic principle is here that there's three phases that they talk about. Early in a product life, value flows into the offering, into that segment of the market. People are really excited about it. They're able to do new things. They're able to do, create customer value with your offering. Then you hit a period of stability. Things are stable. Everybody's making money. It's a good time. But all of a sudden, there's a transition to value outflow. Your talent, your resources, your customers are starting to leave at an accelerating rate. Uh, the competitive intensity happens. Can you command high margins in this environment? No. You're cutting prices to win sales at this point. Your margins are, are getting cratered. And your profitability, as a result, is starting to suffer. I hate to do this to a company that I really, really like. Except they had a huge period of time where there's value inflow. There was a period of competitive stability in the 80s, 90s even. Fujifilm, Agfa, everybody was happy. Market was there. File for bankruptcy. In between there, they went through. A, they tried to sell their IP. How successful were they selling IP? Not so much. I think everybody waited until they were in bankruptcy, figured they could get a better deal. What's some of that IP that they have? Kodak invented the digital camera in 1976. They had the opportunity to capitalize on this value migration. They were actually the number one market share in digital cameras in the early 2000s. But they failed to capitalize on moving the rest of their business model and the resources to support that. So that transition I talked about, here's some of the characteristics. Your volume is high. You're doing well. Revenue's growing, customers are happy, you're seeing repeat business. Everything that you want is going your way. You're focusing on superior execution. Okay, we've got to get our costs down, we've got to be more efficient, reduce inventory, increase turns, blah, 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 blah. But your time in the stability phase is limited. You've got to realize that because value migrates. At some point, it's going to leave. The stability phase in today's day and age is actually getting quite a bit shorter. I want to talk about the third model I want to introduce today. It's by Jeffrey Moore. We've had the opportunity to have Jeffrey and his team come in and talk to us at, uh, at NetApp. The latest book is called Escape Velocity. And he defines um, three horizons that you have to think of your product, your innovation cycle on. 
Horizon One businesses are the stuff that are material to your current earnings today, how you pay the bills. They generate today's cash flow. Horizon two is, two is one to three years out. Those are the businesses that are growing that are gonna replace those Horizon One businesses. And Horizon three, 36 plus months out, these are your options. This is where your research and development, your research team, generally speaking, is tinkering around. Is this a model that makes sense to people? There's another way to, to, to look at it. He puts it here, is that, uh, like all consultants, he puts it in a two by two matrix, right? Uh, so he divides it into high growth businesses and low growth businesses, and then the two uh, axes on the, on the Y are, are, are these products material to your current earnings, i.e. do they show up in your income statement when you file the year end report, or are they not? Simple bifurcation. His analysis shows that most companies, larger companies with a product portfolio of more than one product, have a bunch of products down here in this lower realm. They have some low growth or no growth products that really are just legacy things that sometimes just consume resources, support dollars that you have to have but you're not making any money on them. But most businesses are high, moving to low growth up there. So another way that I want to phrase this is you've got ideas that are coming in, and we heard it could, be, could come from a community, could, could come from open innovation, could come from your own labs. But you're moving these Horizon 3 businesses in. You're transitioning Horizon 3 businesses to Horizon 2. You're moving them up to the point where they become viable and material to company earnings, and they become Horizon 1 businesses and part of the mainstream. Logical series of events, right? It's exactly how most organizations are structured. Problem is, they find that most companies have a real dearth of Horizon 2 businesses. And one of the reasons is, all of those Horizon 3 businesses get, go forward and somebody says, I've got a Horizon 3 business that's gonna be $100 million in 12 months. And if you're an entrepreneur, doesn't that sound like a good number? If you're a $6 billion company, charged with growing 10% a year, how much do you have to generate in new business every year? $600 million. If you're Procter & Gamble, you're an $80 billion business, now you've got to generate $8 billion in business every year. Is a $100 million business interesting at that point? No. So what happens is a lot of Horizon 3 businesses are held to Horizon 1 financial objectives and they cannot meet them. They fundamentally cannot meet them. They're doomed from the start. So companies fail to do these Horizon 2 businesses. We're no different. Studying this a little bit more, you basically have two fundamental transitions, as we talked about. From an R&D project into a going concern, and then from a Horizon 2 business to a Horizon 1. Let's call that alpha and beta risk. Your risk of not investing at the alpha stage is you miss new opportunities, right? The risk in beta is you miss big opportunities. So if I, if I uh, look at this again, I've got two questions that these uh, horizon transitions are meant to answer. The first one is, is there a business for it? That's to say, yep, there's $100 million in 12 months. Great. That's, that would answer the question positively. The next question is, is there a big business? In other words, can it scale? Now, do you think it's the same set of resources and skill bases that are required for both of those businesses, both of those transitions? They're fundamentally different resources and different skill sets that are required. Down here, you're looking at an entrepreneurial kind of environment. Now, one of the major challenges of any corporation is to try and foster an entrepreneurial startup kind of culture. Cisco has an interesting model. They just announced another, another version of it. They call it spin-in. They took $150 million, $100 million, handpicked some engineers, and created a company outside of, of Cisco. Allowed them to staff it however they want, manage it independently, and said, if you're successful, against some criteria, we'll buy you for $750 million. And they brought it back in. They've done this three times. Very successful model for Cisco financially. However, it creates some problems. How come that person got picked to be an instant millionaire and I didn't? Because everybody, one of these founders, has an equity stake in it. And then when they get bought back in, everybody winds up being rich. So there's a cultural problem inside Cisco that they have to, have to wrestle with. So the other one is an operations thing. How do I scale this up? How do I make, make it into a billion dollar, two billion dollar business? Fundamentally different set of skills. 
Where are you going to be investing more research and development money? Entrepreneurial phase, right? Where are you going to be investing a lot more sales and marketing money? The top one, because you're, you're, you're out there growing the business. So I want to focus on that last transition, because this is the one that's the hardest one for us to do. At NetApp, what we decided to do is we're going to start to create customer value through partnerships. We have an organization called Solutions and Integration Group. And in that group, we have a very, very poorly named organization called a Solutions Incubator. But what it is is it takes products that are nearly ready for commercialization and it runs it through a process to bring it out as a large business on the other end. So I want to focus a little bit more about what we're doing in terms of partnership thinking. And the principle is completing the whole product. Has anybody heard of the principle of the whole product? Definitions up here. It's the minimum set of products and services that your customers are buying in order to get a particular job done. You're giving him or her a compelling reason to buy. Jeffrey Moore says, in expanding upon this, he says, what you're trying to be is something or everything for somebody, not something for everybody. So the idea is that you find a target set of customers who have a need and create exactly what they need to buy it and a turnkey solution. seen the value chain before. This is Michael Porter, classic business. It defines all the operations inside of a business. Has anybody participated in any outsourcing discussions? Very often you're looking for outsourcing to do what? Save yourself some money. It's all about inside the company. What we're talking about in partnerships is, is fundamentally different. We're talking about how to create customer value. So we're going to be looking outside the company. So our premise is that your success is achieved by Engaging the right resources at the right time and place according to the buying behavior of your customers. You want to sell it to them in the way that they like to buy. And variation on your chart about being in the right time, right place. So what do we mean by resources? And here's where I'm going to veer out of a typical kind of technology-oriented talk. Resources are all the things you see up there that, are, that, in, that involve the customer and involve the customer's buying decision. Everywhere from original equipment manufacturers, NetApp OEM stuff for IBM, for instance. We create the product manufacture it, give it to IBM, they put their label on it, sell it, and support it. Great route to market for us. All the way down to a direct sales force. We have one of those, too. We sell NetApp branded products to large enterprises um, through our direct sales force. And all of the other things in there represent resources that you can bring to bear to create value for your customers. Influencers. You need them. Actually, you need positive influencers. <laughs> Um, we, had a, a, we have a product that I'll talk a little bit about later on called FlexPod. It's, uh, it's kind of the embodiment of our partnership thinking. Uh, EMC made an announcement. They're our largest competitor. Um, they made an announcement recently, and the press called it EMC's FlexPod. That's good. When you've got the, the analysts and the influencers writing about your competitor's product and using your brand name to describe what the value proposition is, that's good news. So. What kind of partnerships might you envision? Well, at the very bottom, joint marketing and distribution. Move up. You might be licensing or doing a private label deal. You can do some R&D, joint R&D, technology transfer back and forth, usually done by licensing technology. Joint venture, uh, forming a new entity where you both are equity holders. Or you can do an acquisition. And the, and the chart is meant to funnel up in, in terms of the volume of deals that are done in each of those kind of things. And I want to talk about a simple sales cycle. How do people buy? What stages do you need to go through? Well, first off, the demand generation. If you've got an innovative product, what's the number one challenge that you face? Making people aware of it, right? If you've got something that's truly innovative, like we talked about earlier, Steve Jobs says, my customers aren't, you know, it's not their job to know what it was. Henry Ford said, if I ask my customers what they want, they'd say a faster horse. So you've got to do some awareness. Small company, for instance, or even a large company. How easy is it to generate awareness all by yourself? It's tough. Next stage is pre-sales. OK, so you've created awareness, and somebody has shown some interest. Well, you've got to figure out whether the solution's right for them. The next stage is you've got to close the deal. You have to deploy it, and then you have to support it. I want to step through each of those uh, individually. In demand generation, you've got to do all those things. Can a partner help you do that? For instance, if you want to reach small business, I worked at IBM. We desperately wanted to sell personal computers to small and medium businesses. We had a great direct sales force. We were selling them 10,000 at a time. 
So we wanted to sell to small and medium businesses. Did small and medium businesses deserve to have an IBM account rep call on each and every one of them? No, that's just terribly inefficient. We were not making much money on PCs anyway. Matter of fact, we lost a lot of money, which is why it's now called Lenovo. Um, the channel, solutions integrators, value-added resellers were the way that small businesses reached. They, they were usually regional. So we went to these channels and we said, we'd love to uh, engage you. We, we've got uh, business recovery, business continuity services. We've got financing. We've got configuration support. We've got all kinds of models. Um, we'll bundle it up for you. You can resell it under your own name, uh, some of the service packages. What can we do to win your business? You know what they said? Nothing. Compaq is what we sell. Of all the different PCs that are out there, Compaq is the one that we've told our customers is the one to buy. That's the only one we sell. And Compaq takes great care of us. Every quarter, they, they host us, tell us what the new products are going to be. They give us all the services that you just did. If we were to all of a sudden say, you know what, for the last couple of years we've been telling you Compaq is the product to buy, but now it's IBM, what do you think our credibility with our customers would do? So that's the power of having partnerships in the channel. Very, very profound. So in the next stage, pre-sales. This is where you do, you know, configure out options, customize things. Again, this is where a partner can really help you out as you're trying to reach large businesses and scale up. I'm not talking about this for that entrepreneurial stage so much, but I'm talking about as you're trying to scale something into a large Horizon One business. You need to understand your prospects' wants and pains. This is not something that you can do all by yourself. You need some help there. Get the order. Final negotiations, sign the contract, complete the financial arrangements, figure out what the terms are, maybe even arrange some financing from a third party or something like that. And very often, when does the customer believe that the re relationship starts? Right here. Where do most salespeople think that the relationship ends? Right there. But the thing is that if you deploy and support correctly, the next time that they come back and need more product, they bypass those first two stages. They just come back and order again. If you do a bad job deploying and supporting, when they need to do it again, they're going to go straight back and do the, uh, the demand generation phase and, and survey the industry again. So deploying is where you, where you fulfill and deliver, and support is how you uh, ensure the proper operation and that the customer's gaining the value that they wanted to out of the offering. Your job here, through your partners and yourself, look for opportunities to make that customer even more successful. So, I've gone through it very quickly. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, FlexPod is our solution. It's basically a data center in a box aimed at particular solutions. Microsoft Exchange for thousands and thousands of users. We've partnered with Cisco to deliver the servers. We've partnered with VMware to deliver virtualization software. Anybody know who owns VMware? A company called EMC. EMC is our number one competitor and the number one vendor in terms of market share in the storage industry. They're a, an acquiring, uh, they acquire like crazy. And one of the things they did to acquire was, was VMware. But to their great credit, they saw that there was a lot more value in allowing VMware to partner up with all kinds of companies. Because they were creating customer value and they were also creating value for EMC itself. So it's kind of a, I think that, the, that one of the, the terms is um, co-opetition. You work together with your, your prime competitor to, to deliver things in, in mutually beneficial arrangements. So that's the way we go at it. Uh, we're looking for partnerships to commercialize three major uh, uh, Horizon 2 opportunities that would go into uh, Horizon 1. One is an open source uh, solution for uh, NoSQL networks. We've got some other products coming up in terms of a core technology that uh, involves uh, highly accelerated memory uh, uh, storage recall. And then uh, a product, if you watch next week, there'll be some uh, interesting big data related announcements. So, in conclusion, successful growth organizations. Um, oh, before I go, remember that Horizon 3, Horizon 2, Horizon 1 model? Where do you think most R&D resources are devoted? Horizon 1's the, your core business, Horizon 3's your R&D. Well, let's take a company like Apple, because everybody can be like Apple. They have a 70, and Google does the same thing, a 70, 20, 10 split in R&D resources against Horizon 1 businesses, Horizon 2, Horizon 3. So 70% goes to support the core business, 20% goes to support Horizon 2 businesses, 
and 10% goes to the R&D for Horizon 3. Think driverless cars as the Horizon 3 business. We had a discussion inside NetApp, and we tried to do our best estimate of what the breakdown and allocation of resources was against Horizon 1 businesses, which is data on tap in our core filing system. Horizon 2 businesses, just getting started, we really don't have any, we're guilty of, of, of uh, Jeffrey Moore's observation. And Horizon uh, 3 businesses, we do pretty well. So if you were to, to, we were to guess what our resource allocation was, we'd say it was 95, 2, 3. And that's a challenge that a lot of successful growth companies. This is a constraint against our ability to innovate. We'd love to have 20% of our resources for, for uh, Horizon 2 businesses. But it's very, very difficult to say, why would I divert resources from the thing that's feeding the cash flow right now? What I've hoped to do here is show you that there are some models that underpin that just because you're doing really, really well financially today, the seeds of, of destruction are being sown, or were sown a little while ago. And measuring your current business investments by your current financial results is a dangerous, dangerous move. And we're seeing that with, with some of the companies that are out there today. And I think to NetApp's great credit, they recognize that. They've adopted this as a model that makes sense and explains behavior. And we're starting to do the investment reallocation inside the company away from data on tap. Not that we're going to be stopping innovation in that because, hey, it pays the bills. But we're going to be looking for more of these Horizon 2 opportunities. And we're focusing on partnerships to make that transition from a small business to a big business. So in summary, we need to allocate resources across both current products, emerging products, and new areas. This Three Horizons model allows us the opportunity to do that, a structure to explain why stuff happens. And we've chosen a partnership-based model to turn those Horizon 2 businesses, our opportunities, into Horizon 1 businesses. And we've enjoyed a considerable amount of success with, uh, with our FlexPod model as an example. We've got several others, but I wanted to just do that. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, Jeffrey? Okay, if there are any questions, I'd be delighted to take those. Those are, those are, most of those are figures from the books themselves. And I take, I, I, I try and, and learn from the, the best minds that are writing the books out there, bring them into my course, and, uh, and, and help understand them a little bit better and how to apply them. It's going to vary by the, uh, uh, the pace of change in your industry, how quickly things turn over. Uh, we've found that for fairly mature businesses like storage, um, uh, you know, and, and who, would be, who would argue with you in, in following Apple's resource allocation of a 70-20-10 kind of thing, uh, assuming that your resource budget, uh, your R&D budget is a, is a significant enough portion of total sales. Um, I, I don't remember exactly offhand what ours is, but it's in the five-ish percent range of, of total revenue. That gives you a substantial bank by which you can devote it to those things. But the temptation is always to plow it right back into the thing that's paying the bills. And it's a very, very hard way to, to, to say, OK, well, you're going to get less of that, and we're going to give it more to this emerging opportunity. It's a difficult decision. I recognize that. Yes, sir? Excuse me? It's uh, uh, Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll dance with anybody who comes. No. Um, it, you, you have to have uh, com, uh, compatible cultures of your companies. You have to have, generally speaking, of, of uh, roughly equal size. Because you know, a small company wants to partner with a big company. It's a bet the farm kind of project for a small company. And it's usually a curious experiment. And, well, let's see what happens to the big company. So you've got different motivations and different uh, uh, expectations and different tolerances for failure. The large company, it's not a big deal. Small company, it could put the company out of business. So uh, do you have the right channels? Do you have the right set of customers? Are they complementary? Uh, are we going to be able to, to create more value for customers together than we would individually? Uh, those are the kind of things that we look at before we ever get into the idea of, of, uh, of signing an agreement with a go-to-market kind of strategy. I also want to make sure that, that the brands enhance one another. I think there was a, the, that Ian made a statement about uh, do you have the brand to, compo to, com to attract a community? The same thing, do, do the brands mutually uh, reinforce in, in terms of the marketplace? Do 
the horizon, well, if I'm working as a researcher, and I, and I, as part of the office of the chief technology officer, our, the largest number of, of individuals in our, our team are in the research community. Um, the way that they generally get called into a horizon one uh, opportunity is if there's a major problem. And the resources get pulled out, sucked in, because it's an all hands on deck kind of exercise to solve the problem. Generally in the horizon one businesses. Uh, for two reasons. One is the technology is, is so different. The Horizon One businesses are dealing with today's technology. Uh, you know, hard drives are what we're working with today as the basis of, of, our, of our storage systems. When you're looking three to five years out, there's stuff out there called storage class memory, phase change memory, spin torque memory. That's the stuff we're working on. It is completely irrelevant <laughs> to, to the Horizon One business, but it's one of the businesses that will help us jump those S-curves as, as the next wave comes down. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Leave the um, wireless.